Hey everyone, and welcome back to Space Talk. I'm Hujuana, and today we are back with our Realistic Weapons series. This time around, we are continuing with Energy Weapons by taking a little look at Particle Beams, which are overlooked even more than Realistic Laser Weapons. Yes, there are things like phases, which are technically speaking Particle Weapons, but those use very fictional particles with very fictional effects. Those are great, but I'm going to be talking about ones that use real physics. As you may already know, these are already very common for all sorts of uses, and have been for decades. You know those old CRT monitors and televisions? Those are electron guns. Beyond those though, they have more useful applications, from medical uses like x-ray machines or radiotherapy, to scientific exploration like the Large Hadron Collider. When weaponized, they are somewhat comparable to lasers as they can deal damage in a similar manner, but I'll talk about that more later on. Their big disadvantage compared to lasers is their range, firstly because they simply travel slower. A laser beam will always be travelling at the speed of light, while particle beams are going to be various levels below that. This is pretty minor compared to something else though, electrostatic bloom. As a particle beam is made up of particles with the same charge, they all repel each other, pushing each other away, expanding the size of the beam. Think of it like water, which in a small area can carve through rocks, but over a large area it's just a cloud. Before we get to that stage though, we have to start out with a particle source, our ammunition. We can pick from a fair few options here, with the caveat that it must have a positive or negative charge for us to be able to move it around. The two most common choices here are negatively charged electrons or positively charged protons, because they are by far the lowest mass. Though between the two, electrons are around 2000 times less massive than protons, so they are around 2000 times easier to accelerate. Bigger than those two, we get into the realms of ions, full atoms with an electrical charge, but these are even harder to accelerate as they are made up of multiple electrons and protons, with neutrons also along for the ride. You could also use more exotic things like antimatter or muons, but the difficulty in producing them compared to anything else means you probably wouldn't even bother. You can also choose even larger particles, something called macrons, but these are sort of a hybrid particle kinetic weapon, so I'm going to save them for a future video. Subscribe now to be notified when that one goes out. So we have our particles, but now we need to accelerate them. There are lots of types of accelerator, but the ones most applicable towards weaponization are either linear accelerators, aka Linax, or circular accelerators, which also tend to have a Linax starter stage. Each of these has its pros and cons, such as circular ones potentially being more compact because you can loop a particle through it multiple times to keep accelerating. The downside is needing strong ass magnets to bend the beam and stop it from hitting the walls of the accelerator. These are best used for everything heavier than an electron, as you can run them through over and over. Linax don't have this problem, but instead can get pretty long depending on what you want to accelerate, as you can only send a particle down its length once. Also, electrons can only really be put into these, as trying to bend their path results in a bit of an ugly spray of x-rays, which is bad. There are also sort of hybrid designs where you can put U-turns into a Linac, either folding it in half or even making a NASCAR track for your particles. No matter what variety you use though, they all require high amounts of current and energy to be transferred to particles in a short amount of time, and electromagnets to bend a beam path are also going to need their own power and cooling, so don't forget those radiators. You also need some way of focusing the beam using a special lens. For low velocity beams, it's possible to use an electrostatic lens, where you have a voltage difference between the centre and edge of the beams to push or pull things into and out of focus. These get less effective as beam velocity goes up though, so we need to switch to magnetic lenses for really sanic tear particles. After our particles have been fired, we no longer need them to be charged, so we can avoid the problem of electrostatic bloom by neutralising the beam. Simply put, if the particles have no charge, they won't repel each other. There's a few methods of neutralization, the easiest being to just squirt opposite charged stuff into the beam to even it all out, but this can defocus the beam a little bit as everyone gets to know each other. You don't need to do this step though, if for example you don't mind the bloom because your particles are really heavy and spread out slowly anyway. The downside here is that your spacecraft will end up building up a static charge, which might end up causing issues when docking, but it's not too big of a deal and there's ways to clean it up. You can wait for solar winds to blow it off you or just fire off more particles of the appropriate charge. 
Particle beams do have a lot of varied impact effects depending on the size of the particles used. Starting at heavy ions like lead or gold or uranium, they act very similarly to lasers because they don't penetrate very far. If you want to learn more here, go watch our laser weapons video to get a better idea of the sort of damage that occurs. The lighter the particle gets though, the more they can penetrate their target, and more of a second, far deadlier type of damage occurs. You see, when lone protons pass through regular matter, funky things happen. Atoms get ionised, subatomic particles can get knocked out, and worst of all, photons appear. These aren't friendly little light wavicles though, these are high energy things you know better as x-rays, or worse. This is called breaking radiation, or, and I'm sorry to our German speaking viewers, Bremsstrahlung. Understandably, this is not very healthy for people or even electronics to be exposed to. Electron beams are even better at this than proton beams, as they go straight to spewing out deadly radiation, and a lot of it too. This is because they cause cascades where photons split up protons and electrons, which make more photons, and that just goes on and on. So particle beams can be used as a worse laser, but with the easily accelerated lighter particles, you can end up sterilising enemy ships, ready for you to capture completely intact. Just send in a cleanup crew first. In order to protect against this style of attack, it's necessary to use radiation shielding, but this happens to end up being very mass heavy if just going for multiple metre thick slabs of material. That's fine if you have soft sci-fi engine tech like say Galactica does, but mass is the enemy for realistic spacecraft. For mass efficient shielding, we can look towards the very same methods used to control charged particles in the first place, electrostatic and magnetic fields. Electrostatic shielding is great because it works even on neutral beams as their very first layer strips the electrons off each incoming particle, giving it a positive charge. The main active part of it is made up of two conductive plates with a large voltage potential between them, sandwiched around a dielectric material, a special type of insulator. When a charged particle strikes all this, it slows down and drains the charge in the armour. So you put the brakes on the particle beam, but it just spews out x-rays. If you prefer not being hit by radiation making death beams in the first place, you can use magnetic fields to bend them off course. The downside is that if the incoming beam is stronger than your magnetic deflector, it's just going to continue on its merry way. The problem is, it's only possible to magnetically deflect a charged beam, so one that has been neutralised cannot be bounced or bent away without first recharging it. This can be done in a number of ways, such as by firing an electron beam at an incoming neutral one, or by using an ionising ultraviolet laser. But in practical terms, hitting a tiny little pencil beam with another one at long range and while moving is going to be so challenging it may as well be impossible. Scientists struggle enough with getting particle beams to collide down here in controlled environments. For lower velocity incoming neutral beams, there's two other methods of charging them up to be deflected, the first of which is just chucking thin metal sheets in the way of the beam, which strips its electrons. However, supporting lasers can cut through such thin sheets very easily. A big volume of plasma can also strip electrons, like a sort of thick, magnetically contained artificial atmosphere, and a laser can't sweep this away quite so easily. The downside is it requires power to maintain. So if you wanted some crazy high-tech feeling shield system that was realistic, use particle beams in your setting, fended off by plasma screens and magnetic deflectors. You can also offload these two steps to sub-vessels if you know the direction the attack will come from. This works out great from a power requirement standpoint as well, as the further away you can deflect the beam, the less magnetic strength you need to bend it. Remember when I mentioned how electrons have like 2000 times less mass than a proton? Well, that makes electrons comparatively easy to push to extremely high velocities, even those approaching the speed of light. And way up at those velocities, you start getting funky with relativity. The thing we are interested in here is time dilation, which is a sort of cheaty way to get around those bloom effects that put a limit on particle beam range. From the perspective of an electron in this beam, it blooms like normal, but from the perspective of the lowly normal velocities we actually live in, it takes a long time. So long, in fact, it doesn't become the limiting factor on range, and things like jitter do instead. This is known as an ultra-relativistic electron beam, or UREB for short. Which sounds a bit silly to me, can we think of a cooler name for them? I've seen E-beam suggested a fair bit, but that still doesn't sound as cool as like, Cassaba Howitzer does. 
Anyway, beyond their effective lack of bloom, the insane energy levels, which is comparable with cosmic rays, means they can penetrate all but the most ridiculous amounts of physical armour. And even if they are stopped, the Brem Stralung they make comes out in the form of gamma rays. The same thing applies to a magnetic deflector, which would need to be improbably high powered to bend the beam away from its target. Remember, way back when I said you have to run electron beams from a linear accelerator because bending them makes x-rays? Well, this is called synchrotron radiation, and from really high energy beams, this comes out in the form of gamma rays again. So UREBs essentially don't have bloom, have longer than laser beam levels of range, are very hard to armour against, and essentially cannot be deflected. As a fun bonus effect, they are also at such high energy levels they can make fissionable materials fizzle, so they can destructively disable nukes as well. So give particle beams a try, they are high tech, high power and highly destructive, but also introduce some interesting things for defending against them. You can have hugely thick armoured vessels slugging death beams at each other, or positional warfare based around long range deflection drones and plasma fields. They can spice up a realistic setting, or even fit in nicely to a softer sci-fi thing as a super weapon. Just beware the consequences of having such highly lethal weapons flying around. The knock-on effects in a story may be more destructive than the weapon itself. Thank you for watching, and an especially huge thanks to the people who helped me out and answered my questions in the Beams channel. You know who you are. Beyond that, please like and subscribe for future content like this. You can support these videos more directly here on YouTube by becoming a channel member or by giving us super thanks. You can also join our Patreon like these people on screen right now. Thanks again for watching, and happy holidays.